Hey folks, it's Mr. Flyer here, hope you're well, and welcome back to another Bike News. This time it's for the month of November 2021, which has flown by once again. If you're interested in what's been going on in the world of motorcycles here in the UK for this month, stick around, stay tuned, loads of news to take you through. Alrighty, and don't forget, once we've done the bike news, I will be giving you a load of parish notices as well. Lots of things to tell you about uh, coming up in the next month here on the channel, so stick around to the end of the video if you're interested in that. Alright, loads to go through. Because of the way that uh, the timing sometimes works, I've actually got five copies of MCN to go through this month, so uh, grab yourself a brew. This is likely to be a long one. Hopefully, the camera's not going to overheat this time because I've got a clever little setup with a fan blowing on the camera, so you might be able to hear a bit of a buzz in the background, but uh, hopefully it'll mean the camera won't overheat. We'll see. We'll... We'll see how that one works out. All right, first paper then. And the first story here, Ducati's Stunning Silence. Now this is quite interesting because this is a new electric sports bike from Ducati. Uh, and in the past, I distinctly remember Ducati saying that they weren't getting into electric bikes, but I guess that might have been a few years ago now. And uh, of course, all uh, vehicle manufacturers are having to get into electric vehicles, aren't they? Uh, whether that's a good or bad thing, I'll let you decide. Anyway, this bike here is all about um, racing. Uh, so Ducati will become the sole bike supplier in the Moto E World Cup from, from the 2023 season, signing a four season deal with Dorna. Uh, it was revealed last week that the MotoGP manufacturer will take over from fellow Italian company Energica. Um, Ducati CEO Claudio Domenicali said, uh, at Ducati our core values are style, sophistication and performance, so we decided to enter electrical mobility from the top. And there's no better way than competition to test and learn. Fair enough. Uh, it says here, uh, Ducati want to provide performance requested by Dorna whilst also trying to ensure the bike is as light as possible. Uh, Ducati are creating the Moto e-bike from scratch, but hope to have a road version in production sometime after 2025. So we're looking a little bit down the track, but it uh, looks like we are going to be having uh, electric Ducatis after all. Uh, the biggest challenge is the weight compared to the range, it says here. Uh, Domenicali added that he doesn't believe that the future performance uh, bikes are solely electric, but it will remain with internal combustion albeit with synthetic fuels rather than petrol. And that's something we talked about, didn't we, on a previous uh, bike news as to whether actually electric is the way for motorcycles or whether synthetic fuels or alternative fuels are the way to go. And we talked about hydrogen before. Uh, Domeni Charlie thinks that that's probably more likely than electric. But we shall see. We shall see. Interesting. Lovely looking... Um, uh, render here of what the bike might look like. I don't know if that's just an MCN mock-up or whether that's something that Ducati have provided, but uh, yeah, it looks beautiful if that's the electric bike. Very nice indeed. All right, next up then. Make sports touring great again. Africa Twin Engine finds new home in Honda's 11,999 NT 1100. So this is another sports tourer uh, coming to the market. Hot on the heels, of course, of Suzuki's GSX 1000 GT that we talked about last time. This one looks, uh, looks lovely. Big old uh, front fairing on here to give you lots of wind protection. Looks great for the Pillion 2. Big, um, big capacity panniers by looks of it, big screen, exactly what you want from a touring bike. And it doesn't look unattractive either, I have to say. What does it say here? I'll tell you. It says here, Honda have brought touring back into focus with their new NT1100, an Africa twin-based sports tourer. Honda says they've built the bike because there's a large group of people out there who want the comfort, technology and performance of modern adventure bikes without the lofty seat height or associated cost. Oh, I absolutely agree with that. Um, uh, there are so many people out there that have bought GSs and Multistrazers and things like that, I think, because they really wanted a sports tourer, uh, and those things uh, fitted the bill. No intention of ever taking them off the road on one such person, for example. Anyway, it says here, the new bike is powered on by the 1084cc parallel twin from the Africa Twin. It now produces 100.5 bhp at 7,250 rpm um, and 75 foot-pounds of torque but otherwise it's unchanged, the engine what that is. The suspension is much shorter travel. Uh, the result of this is a greatly reduced seat height of just 820 mil. The Africa Twin, quite a tall bike. I found it a bit too tall for me to live with. Uh, this uh, is reduced at 820. It's still quite tall, but uh, a bit more manageable. Uh, the NT is wrapped in wind deflecting bodywork with five position screen designed to divert air over and around the rider. Panniers, cruise control, centre stand and heater grips all come as standard, which will sound like exactly the sort of thing you need on a touring bike, don't they? Also an optional rear top box, com comfort seat and tank bag. Now why is the comfort seat an optional extra? That should be on there as standard, surely. I never quite understand why manufacturers do that. A quick shifter and auto blipper is also available as an option. Honda have managed to keep the weight to a sensible 238 kilograms with fuel, uh, or 248 if you get the DCT version, which is probably the one I would go for. Big fan of DCT gearboxes. Uh, the NT1100 will arrive in dealers in January with a standard model priced at 11,999 DCT. T 12,999. So it seems like 
pretty good price actually. A lot of money of course, but it's a big old bike with uh, all the features you want for touring. Uh, I do like the look of that. I think that's going to be a success for Honda. Cannot wait to have a go on that if they'll let me maybe next year. That would be good. All right, interested to hear your thoughts on that and your thoughts generally on the, the sport touring market, whether that is the way that uh, manufacturers should be going. We're seeing so many doing that now rather than focusing on the big adventure bikes like they have done in the past. All right, next up here. Now this is the article where um, MCN each week give a mythical amount of money to somebody, a biking celeb, uh, and say, what would you buy? This week, it's a guy called Darren Wunukowski. Wunukowski? Anyway, it turns out he's some sort of suspension expert. And he said if he had 4,000 quid, he would buy a 2014 Yamaha MT-07. I wouldn't. I would buy, and no surprise here to regular viewers, what it says down here, a 2011 Triumph Street Triple R. You can pick one up for 4,500, it says here. And it says the last of the underseat pipe street triples. The R comes with the upgraded brakes and suspension. It makes for an amazing sporty middleweight with a bit more raw spirit than the updated model. I could not agree more. Although I disagree slightly because I've got a 2012. Uh, mine has underseat pipes, so the 2011 isn't quite the end of the line for the underseat uh, exhaust. And if you're clever and lucky, like me, you can get yourself a 2012 model with underseat um, exhaust, uh, all the hooliganess, hooliganess of the original Street Triple and uh, the slightly newer shaped lights like mine. So look for the 2012 and you'll get one of those for about five, five and a half grand uh, for a good one, something like that. Anyway, yeah, that's why I go for Street Triple R, brilliant bike, uh, even the older one. In fact, to some, in some respects, I prefer the older Street Triples to the new ones. Again, interested in your views on that too, if you're an owner. Right, next story, what do we got here? Talking point, we must fight ban on bike mods. Now, do you remember there was that um, uh, item, I think in last bike news, might be the one before, about the fact that there's some new legislation coming along that's aimed at electric vehicles to stop them being modded, but has the unintended consequence of meaning if it comes in, we won't be able to mod our motorcycles here in the UK anymore. And there was a petition, uh, not a petition, there was a um, consultation that the government were running. I encourage people to go and fill it in, which many of you told me you did, so thank you very much indeed for doing that. But there's a letter here from somebody called Andrew Walker, all about it. I write with reference to the DFT looking to ban modifications. This is a typical government website that takes absolutely ages to navigate. I gave up halfway through. Can we call upon MAG to organise some form of statement supported by group petition that would be accepted by the consultation process? Signing up to a petition is far easier and will hopefully result in huge numbers. I could not agree more. That website, the official website that the DFT put up, was really complicated to, to go and fill in. There was all sorts of questions you had to answer that were nothing to do with motorcycles. I filled it in and you, lots of you told me you did the same thing. You just filled in the relevant parts. That's what I did. I hope that will work. But I do agree with uh, Andrew Walk here that if there was a petition that we could sign, that would probably uh, be easier. Don't know whether it'd have much effect or not. But uh, anyway, yeah, thanks to those of you that did sign up uh, on that official website. But crikey, wasn't it hard? I mean, I, the cynic in me makes me wonder whether the government do that purposely. I, I like to think they don't, but who knows? Okay, last story in the first paper. Guilty as charged, there's no doubt they're fun, but does fast charging make electric bikes viable? Good question. They've pitted here the Energica Eva Rebel against the Harley Davidson Livewire, neither of which I've ridden actually. So I'm just purely here looking to see what the verdict was of the comparison of these two bikes that MCN have put up. Uh, they're both very expensive. The uh, Energica 25695, the Harley Davidson 27495. Both expensive, both look quite nice though, um, and I'm sure our great bikes as electric bikes go. It's saying here 143 brake horsepower for the Energica, 103 for the Harley, 260 kilograms wet weight for the Energica, 251 for the Harley. This is one of the things that I don't like about electric bikes. Yes, they're fast, um, so, which is quite novel if you've never ridden one at all. It's definitely worth having a go because the acceleration is unbelievable, uh, but they are quite heavy. They are quite heavy. Anyway, what did uh, MCN have to say, verdict wise? Looking at the pure riding experience, they are very hard to criticise. Um, the infrastructure was the biggest challenge and one that held them back on the MCN 250. This is the standard test route that MCN used for various bikes, 250 miles round. And of course, with electric bikes, range is one of the issues. Um, it says here, uh, too often on fun B-road areas, we were left waiting for one bike to charge before the next one could get some power, which was a frustrating waste of time and turned what is usually a seven hour test into a marathon that lasted 11 hours. Uh, so there we go, that's not, that's not exactly a ringing endorsement of electric bikes yet, is it? So a uh, bit of a thumbs down from MCN on both those bikes in practical terms if you want to do a bit of a day's riding. Um, so not quite there yet, are they? The price still isn't right, uh, the performance is certainly there, but for me the weight isn't there, the charging time isn't right, and the um, infrastructure still isn't there. But uh, give it a few years, I'm sure things will catch up. Alrighty, that's it for the first paper. Next one, here we go, first story here. 
Rebooted XSR packs a punch. Do you like this one or not? Uh, what have I written here? Just looking at the picture here, I actually quite like it. I mean, it's got gold wheels, which uh, for a start, that always wins me over. I'm, I'm easy like that. And I, I have to say, Yamaha, out of all the manufacturers, do do some quite interesting paint schemes, don't they? A lot of them are pretty staid. I'm often criticising uh, Triumph for poor uh, choices of paint schemes. Well, this one looks nice on the XSR 900, but I quite like the old XSR 900. They've done a restyling job on it. And I have to say, I'm not, I don't think I like the looks of this quite as much as I like the original. Uh, how do you think about this? Um, anyway, let's read what it says here. Um, with more power, much improved, lighter yet stronger chassis, plus a 1980s themed styling makeover, the punchy, fun and cool looking triple promises to be one of the stars of 2022. So it's not just a cosmetic uh, makeover they've given it, they've given it, they've changed it as well. Yeah, I'm struggling with the looks of it, I must say. Uh, but with the MT-09 receiving a massive overhaul last year, partly to adhere to Euro 5, it was inevitable the XSR would follow suit. Uh, four brake horsepower power gain, peak power figure is now 119 brake horsepower. Absolutely the sweet spot, I think, for a motorcycle on the road. 120 brake horsepower is ample. Uh, new Brembo radial master cylinder, fully adjustable gold finished inverted KYB forks, plus new spin forged cast wheels. And they do look lovely, as I say. Uprated electronics, new six axis IMU, so it's packed with electronics. Uh, new three and a half inch full color TFT dash. They really have gone to town with this upgrade. I suppose it's been a while since the XSR came out isn't it so it's probably well due an upgrade but uh, yeah interested again to think to uh, sorry to read what your views on this one are is it only me uh, that are thinking that this is a bit of an ugly mug uh, no prices yet been released the xsr 900 is expected to be available from next february it says here but uh, yeah i think it's been quite a big sell for yamaha it'll be interesting to see what this new upgraded uh, one does for them all right next up may the force be with Enfield. Star Wars inspired Meteor leads a tide of custom builds. Now the Royal Enfield Meteor is a is a 350cc um, single cylinder bike. I rode it uh, briefly a few months back. I did a review. I'll stick a link in the corner somewhere. Really enjoyed the engine on this bike uh, and because it's a good value bike it's something like three and a half four grand to, to buy. It makes an ideal starting point for a custom. So people have jumped onto that and started doing it and here's an example of one. It's called the Starship Meteor. It was commissioned from Dutch customizers Ironwood Motorcycles. Uh, Ironwood's Arjan van den Boom and his team then modified it with blacked out components, a floating bobber seat, hand upholstered saddle, Akropovich, um, so it's a special paint job and more. Uh, it's set to be shown by Royal Enfield on the show circuit in a bid to encourage owner customizations of their bikes. What do you make of it? I think it looks really quite mean. I like that. I'm, uh, as you may know, I'm a big fan of custom bikes. I don't quite get the whole scene that goes around them, but I do like the output. I do like the bikes. Um, I've just had my own Royal Enfield uh, customised. Uh, you may have seen that in recent videos. Again, I'll put links in the corner to those. Uh, I'm, the bike's back at the moment. A few people have asked me what's happened to my interceptor that's being uh, done. You may remember a few things on the bike that I wasn't too keen on that needed changes. It's back um, with uh, the um, dealer uh, being changed again. So hopefully we'll be seeing that bike again in a few months time and it'll be all pucker. So high hopes for that and I'll show you that of course as soon as it comes back. All right, moving on. Norton V4 comeback. Look at this. So we've seen this before, the V4, uh, and we all know the story of what happened with Norton when it all went a bit pear-shaped and the, the quality control uh, issues that Norton had uh, with the V4. But it's come back now. It's uh, ready for production, and it is looking absolutely beautiful. So Norton V4 comeback. New owners reveal reworked and re renamed superbike. Sorry. All new and re-engineered to be the most luxurious British superbike ever created, and it's now called the V4 SV. Uh, the claim power has dropped from 200 brake horsepower to 185, and torque is down two. Don't know why they've done that. Uh, this oh, here we go. This torque in power, and, uh, sorry, this drop in power and torque might suggest that New Norton thought the engine was overstressed in the old bike, or perhaps the claim figures are just more accurate now. So yeah, that's interesting. A bit more honest, maybe. Still massively powerful motorcycle, though. You ain't going to need any more than 185 brake horsepower, surely. Uh, the V4 SV will be available in two colours, Manx Silver with red and black pinstriping and red Oz Aluminium. Um, we complete, uh, sorry, red Oz Aluminium wheels or carbon finish complete with carbon fibre BST wheels. Hope that made sense. Uh, no word yet on price or availability, um, but uh, what does it say here? Norton are putting on the new bike's luxuriousness and the outgoing SS model had an eye-watering £44,000 price tag. Uh, so it's unlikely to be cheap. So yeah, this is very much one for the uh, very rich enthusiasts out there, but it does look nice and uh, I bet it sounds awesome too. So uh, lots of goodwill for the new Norton. I think they're doing a great job, you know, with that new factory. They're not messing about this time. Um, let's hope that the bike is a success. The manufacturing is a, is a success and customers are happy. Uh, long overdue that Norton got his act together. So 
Let's hope so this time. All right, final story in here. Uh, it will make many two-stroke fans' hearts skip a beat. In a world-exclusive first test, MCN stroking up Emma Franklin puts the stunning new British-built Langan two-stroke through its paces. Now, we have talked about the Langan two-stroke before. And in fact, I rode alongside this at the um, Goodwood Festival of Speed earlier in the year, I think back in August. So I have seen this in the flesh. I've heard it um, and, um, yeah, had a bit of a look at it. What do you think of it? Well, there's no doubt it's a beautifully made bike. Um, but to me, I just I don't quite get what the love for two-strokes is. Now, I haven't ridden it, so, you know, I'm talking about this as somebody that's coming at this from a basis of you know r no real knowledge i'm just a normal rider like you know many of you watching this i'm not uh, you know any sort of expert on motorcycles at all but to me it just sounds like a you know a motorcycle from the 1980s that a 16 year old might have ridden like you know an old fizzy being thrashed maybe that's the appeal i don't know now i understand that two strokes deliver their power in a completely different way to the way that four strokes do i have ridden a two stroke before one of alan milliards no less and it was great great fun it does put a grin on your face but in the case of this bike this is 33,600 pounds for a two stroke motorcycle yes it looks beautiful yes it's made like a jeweled watch but um I still don't quite get it. What am I missing, folks? Let me know. Anyway, let me lead, read you a couple of things I've highlighted here. It's the most exciting British-built bike in a decade. The 33,600 33, Lang and two-stroke arrived as a site for lockdown sore eyes. Uh, it's electronically injected 75 brake horsepower, 250cc V-twin, high-quality chassis, and 115 kilogram all-up weight. Got two-stroke fans frothing, myself included. It says here from the uh, writer of the article, who I'm not sure who wrote, oh sorry, Emma Franklin. So uh, yeah, 75 brake horsepower doesn't sound much, nor does 250 does it, but of course in two stroke form you can kind of double those, so think a bit more as the same sort of power as 150 brake horsepower maybe. Uh, it's one way of looking at it. I'm sure I'll be criticized for my lack of knowledge here. Anyway, let me know what you think of the Langan. Um, is it, um, am I doing it a disservice here? I don't know, something about it. I'm not keen on. Let's look at what Emma's verdict was. I mean, it, it looks amazing, give it that. Um, the craftsmanship and passion is plain to see from every angle. I don't disagree with that. Uh, as a two-wheel plaything, it performs beautifully with perfect handling, drama and speed. Sure, the experience is a little raw and it does have a few character traits. Hmm. Uh, the Langan is the perfect antidote to mass-produced, homogenized motorcycles. I'm sure it does have a lot of character, but um, yeah, 33 grand. It has to have an awful lot of good character, doesn't it, to, uh, to make that worth that sort of money. But I'm sure there are a few people out there that will snap them up. They're only being made in low numbers. All right, that's it for that paper. Still with me, just have a swig of me brew. Don't forget, we've got uh, parish notices coming up uh, towards the end of the video as well. Stick around for that. Lots of stuff to tell you about what's happening in December. Right, next paper. What, we're on number three of five. Thank you for sticking with us so far. First story here. Masters of Talk, Yamaha give their bold and bonkers Super Naked a significant upgrade. So this is the MT-10, a bike that I rode when uh, just after it first came out. Seems a while ago now when it came out. Didn't like the looks initially, but when I rode it and got to see it in the flesh, I got to love the bike. The MT-10, one of my favourite Nakeds, even though it was kind of the underdog. Didn't quite have the power of the likes of the Super Duke R's uh, and bikes of that ilk. Um, but I really loved it. Yamaha have done an overhaul on this, as, as they've done on so many of their bikes this year. Uh, but I have to say, I'm really disappointed with how it looks. I don't like uh, the lights on the front of it. It's now got beady eyes and um, like eyebrows. Not keen. Um, bit of a shame it's no longer a bike that I sort of lust after, which I did on the old MT-10. Anyway, let's see what it says here. Yamaha have updated the MT-10 for 2022, making it the most powerful version yet. And I don't think it was lacking power anyway, to be honest. Uh, it's now got 164 brake horsepower, up six brake horsepower. The revised engine gets lightweight forged aluminium pistons, offset conrods, direct place cylinders, uh, sorry, direct plated cylinders, which Yamaha say help to increase efficiency, uh, which probably means um, fuel economy, because one of the criticisms of the old bike was it was a bit thirsty. You don't buy a bike like this, though, for fuel economy reasons, do you? I'd argue. Anyway, the fuel injection has been fiddled about with to help boost torque in the mid-range. The intake and exhaust systems have been given more oomph. Uh, the intake is specially tuned to produce what Yamaha claim as a sensual roar at the peak of the mid-range. We all like a bit of a sensual roar, don't we? Excellent. Um, even a pair of acoustic amplifier grills either side of the tank to aim the induction noise right at your waiting lug holes. Brilliant. I love it when bikes do, uh, manufacturers do fun things like this. Uh, the MT-10 gets an angry new face complete with eyes, eyebrows and a nose. Mm. Um, for now, there's no word from Yamaha on the price, but we'd expect it to be... Uh, uh, Expect them to release that over the coming months before the bike arrives in dealers in early 2022, it says here. So 835mm seat height, 
212 kilograms curb weight. So fairly tall seat, not horrendous, and not a horrendous weight either. So I'm sure it's a lovely bike to ride, just as the old one was, but the looks for me now have been sport. I've yet to see it in the flesh. I will see it at the weekend at Motorcycle Live, I hope. Uh, so maybe I'll change my mind. But what do you think of the new MT10? Are they... Um, have they ruined what was a nice bike and just up updated it for the sake of it? I'm sure the, in the, the engine upgrades are worth doing. For me, if they'd done the engine upgrades, um, kept the original look, maybe come up with a few more paint skins, that would have been a better move. But uh, anyway, there we go, new MT10 in the house. Right, couldn't pass this one up. Lightlock, take it to the next level. I mention this because, of course, Lightlock are a channel sponsor. So thank you to the guys from Lightlock. It says here, lightweight motorcycle security specialist Lightlock have unveiled their latest product, the Core Moto. Well, actually, it was unveiled a while ago. I did a video on it. Um, but it's only starting to ship now. There were some issues with um, uh, the whole global supply chain stuff, uh, and they had some manufacturing issues. I understand those are now uh, sorted, and these are shipping now, apparently. And if you pre-ordered one uh, on the back of that last video, if you haven't got your uh, lock already, they should be on their way very soon. Uh, all those people that pre-ordered them will be getting them before people that order them now, if you see what I mean. Anyway, it says here, um, the lock manages sole secure motorcycle gold rating and meets the police preferred specification of secured by design. And if that's not impressive enough, it also won a Red Dot Design Award in 2021 for perfectly meeting the requirements for a security lock that is simultaneously lightweight while offering the most effective protection possible against theft. I use these myself. I, I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I? As I say, they're sponsors of the channel, but I was a fan of this product before they sponsored me. Um, the Core Moto weighs just two and a half kilograms, which Lightlock says 50% lighter than comparable chains. Um, pricing for Core Moto starts at 149.99. But I would say, do check out the links below this video because as ever, you can get a discount. I'll put a link there. You can get a 10% discount off the Lightlock, or if you use the code MF. Lightlock 10, you can get 10% off if you go to the normal website. So check out the links below. If you fancy a little Christmas present to yourself, a Lightlock and, uh, you know, security, important thing. It's a bit, you know, it's a boring subject, but we've got to be, um, you know, alert to the fact that bike thefts do happen, particularly if we're out there in the cities. And I, I haven't yet found a better lock than the Lightlock. All right, moving on. It's a Royal Flush. Royal Enfield have a trio of sales hits on the hands, but which is best? So this is a bit of an odd comparison. They're comparing the Meteor, which we talked about just now, against the Himalayan um, and against the Interceptor. Now, of course, I'm biased because I bought myself an Interceptor. Um, I've ridden the both the other bikes as well. And they're good for what they do, but I, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of the Himalayan, I must say. It's a rugged bike. It seems to be, you know, people love it, but it's not for me. I just don't like the looks. The Meteor rides beautiful, but I don't think the looks are anywhere near in the same league as the Interceptor. That's my kind of summary. Let's see what uh, the verdict was from MCN. No wonder they shift so many bikes, it says here. Um, there's no escape in the fact that the Interceptor is Enfield's best bike. I agree. Um, it's the most Sorry, it's the most flexible with the nicest ride quality, best handling and furthest reaching abilities. It's six grand, it's no wonder they shift so many of the ruddy things, it says here. And uh, yeah, Royal Enfield continued to have a massive sales success on the hands with the Interceptor. Um, keeps, you know, continually selling loads of bikes compared to everything else. Um, so they've given the Interceptor five stars, the um, Himalayan four and the Meteor uh, four stars. So all getting high ratings, but uh, yeah, I would agree the uh, Interceptor is the one to go for if you fancy a, a retro Enfield uh, like I do. Uh, can't wait to get mine back, which uh, hopefully will be soonish. Right, get the full load down. Lower seat makes the new Ducati's Multistrada V2S easier to live with. So this is the sort of one of the answers to that perpetual question, does less actually mean more? So this is the baby Multistrada, if you like, uh, that's come out. This is the one with the, the V2 engine as opposed to the, the V4 in the big full fat Multistrada. And uh, there's some, um, there is an argument to be made to say that this is possibly the better road bike. What have I highlighted here? So less weight, Ducati have removed five kilograms, bring the V2S down to 225 kilograms curb weight. So quite a bit lighter. That's lighter than the old V2. This is the new version for 2022. Um, Ducati have now lowered the seat height from 840 to 830 mil and made the seat slimmer to help you get your feet down more easily, which is a great thing. The Multistrada is, um, you, for me, a tall bike and can be a little bit top heavy. So great that they made it easier to get your feet down. Um, and uh, yeah, looks really lovely. The Multistrada for me is always the best looking of these sort of adventure type bikes. It's never really had any pretensions of being an off-roader, uh, but the V2 I would love to have a go on. So uh, maybe next year, uh, when there is a, these are available, uh, I might be able to get my hands on one and do one of my living with videos. I'd love to do that on this. I think this is a great bike. I haven't ridden the V4S yet either. I'd love to do that too. Uh, if I was in the market for a big adventure trailer type bike, then 
the the uh, Multistrada would be up there with the new GS for me as the two to check out. These are still two of my favourite uh, bikes in that category. All right, last story in this paper. It's a retro revolution. So this is the new Kawasaki uh, Z650 RS. We have mentioned this on the channel before. I love a retro bike, me, and I'm an absolute sucker if one comes out in green and gold, as this one has. Uh, exactly the same colour, actually, as uh, I chose for my um, custom Royal Enfield Interceptor, which I specified those colours long before this came out. So I was a bit gutted when I saw that uh, Kawasaki had come up with this. Quite funny though, uh, at the same time. Anyway, what does it say here? You have to hand it to Kawasaki when it comes to modern retros, they seem to really understand the market. Uh, effectively, a Z650 wearing a set of period pleasing clothes is this bike. Um, the Z650 RS costs 7,700 in black or 7,850 in green or grey. It's well worth spending the extra 150 to have it in green, I reckon. Um, the Brit Retro Trance Street Twin is 8,400 and the Royal Enfield Continental GT is 6,039 by way of comparison. So this sort of sits in between the uh, Triumph and the Royal Enfield. Uh, what do you make of it? I think it looks absolutely lovely, as I said. I'm a little bit disappointed that it's a twin. Um, the, the 950 RS, which I absolutely loved, and I'd love a go on a new one of those, um, is a four cylinder, and that partly, what I loved about that bike so much was its smoothness. I'm always very impressed uh, by four cylinder bikes because I don't own one. Okay, I do have a six cylinder bike, but uh, that's in another league. Um, but yeah, a, a four cylinder 650, which sounded, you know, was a screamer, would have been brilliant, I think. Of course, they had to base this on the existing Z650, so the engine they already had, they weren't going to make a four cylinder just for this bike. But it's such a shame that they didn't because that would have flown off the shelves. But having said that, I'm convinced this one's going to fly off the shelves too. It does look absolutely beautiful. It says here it's fun to ride, soulful, and with a responsive chassis. That, uh, that certainly doesn't feel old school. There's little not to like about the bike and I can see the RS easily outselling the Z650 in the firm's middleweight range and deservedly so, it's a better bike. So uh, John Ari here, the MCN tester, actually prefers the retro version of the bike over the bike that it's based on, the Z650. Uh, but yeah, lovely looking bit of kit. And uh, maybe I might be able to get a go on one of these. It's quite hard for me to ride Kawasaki's, but uh, maybe next year I can, I can blag one from a dealer or something and at least bring you a first ride video. But nice looking bike, if I had space in the garage, might be tempted, although I might be tempted to save up a bit more and go for that 950 just to get that four cylinder engine. Sorry, or is it the 900? You know what I mean, the big 900 RS. All right, there we go, that's it for that paper. Okay, still with me, another two to go. Next one, first story. Street Fighter for the masses. Now this continues this uh, story of is uh, less or is smaller necessarily less, if you see what I mean, in that Ducati have of course now brought out a um, uh, a Street Fighter in V2 form, uh, and this to me looks absolutely brilliant. I think this is a cracking looking machine. I didn't like the Street Fighter originally, I, how wrong I was. Uh, I then had a go on the V4S version of the Street Fighter, and it's such a lovely bike to ride. The look screw on me, it's so nicely made in that Ducati exotica way. Um, yeah, I've really grown on him, and it's my, it's my favorite of the Nakeds at the moment. If I had money and space, I would have a V4S in my garage in a heartbeat. But it might be that this one actually makes more sense on the road, I don't know. Uh, let's see what it says here. So Ducati are broadening the appeal of their Street Fighter lineup for 2022 by adding this smaller, more user-friendly V2 model. Uh, the new Street Fighter V2 looks set to be far more manageable than the V4, although I have to say I found the V4 very manageable, with Ducati opting for a shorter final ratio than the Panigale V2, so that's the sorry, the sports bike version of this, so it's the, the gearing's a little bit shorter, so it should be fun on the road. Uh, for more pulling power on the road, there we go. The new bike's swing arm is also 16 mil longer than that of the Panigale V2 uh, in a bid to deliver greater stability. So this should be a cracking road bike, I think. Um, the six axis IMU, sorry, it has a six axis IMU, meaning lean, at sensitive, um, lean angle sensitive rider aids, engine braking control, wheelie control, traction control, cornering ABS and more, up and down quick shifter, love those on this sort of bike. Uh, it's available for a five under 15 grand in dealerships from December. So 15 grand, you can get yourself one. This is quite a lot of money for what we now regard as a middleweight bike. Uh, but of course, it's not really a middleweight, is it? It's almost a litre and uh, Ducati Exotica, yeah, 15 grand's a lot of money, but a lovely, lovely bike. Uh, 151 brake horsepower, 200 kilogram curb weight. Sounds good to me. We'll look forward to having a go on one of these. What do you think? Would you would you have one of these over the V4? Say money was no object, which one would you go for? This one may well be a better road bike, but uh, would it be in the back of your mind always niggling, oh, I should have got the V4 if you bought the V2? I don't know. I have to say, I bought the Panigale 899, as you may know if you're a regular viewer of the channel, instead of what was then the 1199 Panigale, because it was just, again, a much better road bike, a bit easier to manage. And I've never regretted that purchase. I've never sat back and thought, this bike needs more power. I wish I got the 1199. So, 
I wouldn't hesitate buying the smaller one actually. Um, and for the cost saving, may well uh, be worth doing. But again, interested in your views on that one. Stick them in the comments below. I'd love to read those. Right, next up, KTM. Talking of um, uh, naked bruisers, the KTM Super Duke R. Now, I've often criticised KTMs for the looks, but I have to say the Super Duke R, I just think, is a mean beast of a bike. And they've now come out with a newer version. It's called the e the Duke R Evo. Let's see what it says here. KTM have revealed a new 1290 Super Duke R Evo, complete with semi-active WP suspension. Of course, KTM owned WP. Already impressively damped in standard trim, thanks to fully manually adjustable WP units, the latest Evo will roll off the production line equipped with a second-generation electric WP Apex system, uh, said to provide even greater stability for the rider. Completing the changes uh, is a new livery featuring licks of orange, silver and blue, plus bright orange rims. No prices have yet been set for the standard bike or the Evo, but expect around 16k for the standard bike and 18k for the Evo respectively. Now compare that then to the Ducati Street Fighter. Uh, I think the V4S version is around about 24 grand and the one we just looked at, the V2 version, 15 grand. You could get an Evo for eight, uh, KTM Super Duke um, R Evo for 16, or sorry, 18 uh, MCN are saying. Hmm, that's a thought, isn't it? Of all the KTMs, this is one I really do love, and it is an absolute brute of a bike, and an Evo form with the electronic suspension, 18 grand, it suddenly seems like good value, doesn't it, compared to the V4S Street Fighter. It would be a tough decision if I did have that space in the garage and I did have that money burning a hole in my pocket, it would be between those two. I'd have to ride them both back to back to make a decision, I think. All right, next up. Sporting chance, has Harley's gamble to completely reinvent the Sportster paid off? Now, Harley Davidson, a mark that historically I never rode on the channel, but this year, or 2021, has kind of been the year of the Harley for me. I've ridden a few now, but I haven't got to ride the new Sportster, which is a shame. I did ask them if I could, but I asked them too late. They've uh, basically they've finished doing press bikes for the year. They've defleeted them, I think was the word they used. Uh, so there's not one available. I'm hoping next year I'll be able to ride the new Sportster S, um, because this, of course, was the bike that really, this the Sportster originally was kind of the cheapest entry level bike into the Harley range. Uh, and uh, this new version has caused uh, you know a lot of split opinions. The old diehard Harley fans don't really like it, it seems. But um, you know, maybe it introduces new Harley fans to the, to the market. I think it looks great. What's the verdict that uh, MCN have had, having now ridden it? They have said, Jim Moore, guest tester, it can open Harley Davidson to a whole new audience. And I think this was probably what Harley Davidson were thinking. Purist will take some convincing. It doesn't sound, look or look or feel like a traditional Harley Davidson. But what it does offer in performance, sophistication and sheer presence goes a long way towards backfilling any lack of heritage. Uh, it's there in terms of price too, starting at 13995 so 14 grand. The Sportster S isn't cheap, but at a gra four grand less than the Ducati Di Aval at 1700. Uh, more than oh sorry and 1700 more than an Indian FTR is a tempting alternative to both now I have ridden the Indian FTR that was a lovely bike so this is going to have to go some to compete with this but I have to say it does look nice I like the looks of this they've given it four stars out of five I love the sort of brutish uh, look at this on the picture here with the um, with the big bulbous tyres. I think it looks great, and uh, you know if it's as high tech uh, as the newer bikes from Harley are proving to be, I'm sure it's a it's a brilliant ride. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to having a go on one of these if I can, Harley. If you're watching, that would be great. All right, next story. Just what is the 901? So this is the Husqvarna Nord 901, and uh, this has had a lot of plaudits. People saying that they think this looks absolutely beautiful. I have to say, I think it looks an absolute pig. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I may well be in a minority here, but this thing, I don't generally like um, Dakar-esque bikes. Some are okay, the Africa Twin looks nice, but um, this, to me, is just pig ugly. I'd take the uh, original, the bike that this is based on, the KTM uh, 890 Adventure, to me, is a much nicer looking bike. Even that's a bit odd, because it's got those sort of lardy petrol tanks on it, but it does mean the centre of weight uh, center of gravity is nice to know, so it makes it practical proposition, but this doesn't doesn't work for me. It says here, this is basically a KTM 890 adventure by another name. Yeah, okay, and it's got some new clothes on it. I just uh, I just don't like it. Sorry, folks. Um, let me. Am I the only one? Because everybody else I've talked to about this seem to think they love it. Um, so I'm a little bit shocked about that. I'm sure it's a great bike, um, but no, it doesn't do it for me. Anyway, swiftly moving on then. Captain Sensible, here we are. We mentioned the new Honda NT 1100 a bit earlier. They've uh, now ridden it, or uh, Nevesy, my favourite reviewer, has. Let's see what he has to say. Put simply, the Honda NT 1100 is a low ride Africa twin with new bodywork and road going 17 inch wheels. The NT Sparkle comes from what you'll get value for money wise. It's 11999 as we mentioned earlier for the non 
uh, DCT version. Uh, it's got a goodies galore, adjustable screen, cruise control panniers, centre stand, two chargers, five stage heated grips, five rider modes, three way adjustable torque and wheelie control, ABS, colour dash, LED lights and remote preload adjuster. My goodness me, it is laden with kit for the money, isn't it? Um, what did Neves say? Too sensible for some, uh, but a great value. Uh, Honda's NT1100 is hugely competent tourer, soft, friendly, comfortable, well built and generously equipped. This sounds right up my street. Uh, it may be too sensible for some. Too sensible? Can that even be a thing? Um, the screen can be noisy, but it's a great value all round. Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt it's good value, is it? So, uh, Neavesy liked it. Maybe not sport enough for his taste, but uh, yeah, look forward to having a go with these. Gonna have to have a chat to my friends at Honda to see when I can get a go on this big beast. And I will bring you a full review of this one. Hopefully I'll get it for a bit of an extended period of time and give you one of my more in-depth reviews of what this bike is actually like to live with. All right, hope you're still with me. One more paper to go, and then we're on to parish notices. Do stick with me for those. All right, first thing, elephants in the room. It isn't the article that I wanted to talk about, but here's another example of a Dakar-esque bike, a new one. This is the MV Augusta, uh, and I have to say, that one looks quite nice, but that wasn't the article that I want to talk about on this page. It was this here, limited edition, edition new Enfield 650s. These look lovely. Royal Enfield have unveiled two new limited edition versions of their popular 650 twins. Uh, they feature a special black and chrome tank with individually numbered die-cast brass badges, blacked-out engine and exhaust, special panel decals, and an array of Enfield accessories. Uh, have yet to be announced but uh, these look lovely if these had been around when I was thinking about doing the custom job on my 650 interceptor I probably wouldn't have bothered I probably just would have got one of these I absolutely love the look of this uh, this new um, interceptor just thought I'd draw your attention to it because it hasn't got much press coverage that I've seen this looks lovely there's not gonna be many only 60 of them coming to Europe so if you want one snap one up quick all right moving on I was very tempted actually I, I nearly got in touch uh, with my Enfield dealer and say, can you put my name down for one of these? But then I realised actually, I've already got a, an interceptor and where the heck am I going to put it? It wouldn't be good just keeping it outside. So thought otherwise, but I was very tempted. Anyway, next up, KTM. Sports bike is ready to roll. Now again, I mentioned before I often criticise KTMs on looks and this sports bike, I have to say, it ain't a looker again, is it? Okay, this isn't the final version. This is one that's out on testing. I'm sure this will be an amazing sports bike. KTM do make great, great bikes to ride but uh, it's just the styling department that uh, I have an issue with in some cases. Anyway, let's see what it says. KTM are readying their biggest fully fed sports bike since the full on RC8 V-Twin left production in 2015. Uh, the RC 990 seat, the RC 990 seen here, shows how KTM could appeal to sports bike fans without returning to the extreme superbike market. Uh, mechanically, it takes its components from the next generation parallel twin Duke, which is expected to be a 990. Uh, the chassis is a tubular steel frame in KTM's usual style. It's closer to the 890 Duke's frame. Uh, the swing arm itself, also seen on Duke prototypes as KTM's signature external bracing, but contains a banana curve. I think it's to keep it clear of the exhaust, I'm not sure. KTM aren't likely to launch the RC until the 2024 model year, um, and they're thinking it's going to be around 12,000 quid. So it's powered by the LC8 parallel twin, unusual 285 degree crank, 75 degree V-twin, um, on the Duke R, on the 890 Duke R, it manages 119 brake horsepower, so we're expecting it to be about 130 brake horsepower on this sports bike. So yeah, nice to see them back in the sports bike game. Um, maybe once it's painted up, it'll look a little bit better. It does look a bit like a MotoGP bike, actually, and I have to say, I prefer this over the, um, what's the, uh, the smaller capacity sports bike they do with the sort of see-through front? Can't remember what it's called, the LC, can't remember. Anyway, you know the one I mean. This looks a lot better than that, I have to say. So yeah, I would be interested. I haven't ridden any KTMs for a while, probably a year or so we'll be interested on having a go on this one when it comes out just to see what it does so again interested in your views on that comments below as usual right spirit of the 70s uh, unusual little comparison or or um competition is that the right word that they've done here in mcn on their 250 test they've pitted the triumph uh, trident 660 against the z650 rs that we was talking about earlier the trident which i've ridden like that bike it's a triple of course love the triple engine that's 7395 against 7850 for the z650 z650 rs um the trident puts out 80 brake horsepower whereas the uh, Kawasaki puts out 67 brake horsepower. Let's see what the verdict was on this comparison. This is from Laura Thompson. Uh, I don't think I've come across before. Let's see what she said. First of all, up, they've given them both four out of five stars, which is always disappointing when you get the same because you can't get a, a view of which one's better. Looking at the pictures here, I have to say the Z650's got a much nicer instrument, uh, well, not instrument panel, uh, 
dials, let's call it that for now, dashboard, uh, than the Triumph. The Triumph has got a lovely TFT, if you, TFT is your things, but when you're going down the retro route, I just don't think you can beat clocks. And what Kawasaki have done here is nice looking retro dual clocks together with a, a TFT in the middle for some of that other information. So the best of both worlds, I think. Just more in keeping with a retro style bike. Uh, and certainly Kawasaki looks nicer than the Trident, but I doubt it rides nicer. We'll see. What did Laura say? The Trident is a dynamic roadster, while the Z650 RS is a beguiling retro. Endure both for a Sunday cruise or faster back road blast. Uh, but when it boils down to it, the Trident is the bike I'd choose. The engine is just more exciting. That's interesting. Uh, plus, the Trident is just that bit more versatile, both in terms of user use and rider demographic. So, uh, yeah, Laura is saying the Trident's the better bike, um, which doesn't surprise me, actually. I think uh, it probably is the better bike. It just doesn't look better. If you'd have the Trident's guts in the Kawasaki's, um, with the Kawasaki's looks, that would be the one to go for. Or even, frankly, if the Trident was green with gold wheels, that would probably swing it for me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe with the twin dials as well. Again, what's your view on that comparison? Do you think that's right or should the Kawasaki have won? All right, nearly through, and then it's on to parish notices. Little Fighter, does the new Ducati Street Fighter V2 strike the perfect super naked balance? So Nevesy, my favourite MCN reviewer, has had the chance to ride the uh, Street Fighter V2 now. And he says, uh, Ducati's new 14995 Street Fighter is a naked Panigale V2 with virtually nothing taken away except the fairing. It arrives in dealers in January, uh, shares its wheels, 17 litre tank, and shower forks and sack shock with the um, Panigale. Uh, Monoblock M4.32 Brembo, self bleeding master cylinder well they're carried over two while the brake pads are less aggressive um, but still powerful and free from unwanted abs intervention styling and straight bars mimic the street fighter v4 but despite having no fairing or wings they cost extra apparently the wings incredible um, uh, cost you extra the v2 weighs the same at a claimed 200 kilograms handling is as sharp as a panigale without an excess of power to tie itself in knots and the street fighter v2 is easy to ride it's comfortable and kind to your joints but there's zero wind protection of course it being a naked bike uh, it's 955cc v-twin super quadra engine is slightly detuned uh, it's down just two brake horsepower i don't think we're going to notice that uh, but it has a widespread of easy to grab power, a hunger for revs and a booming exhaust note. Gearing is shorter for added hooliganism. I'm loving the sound of all this. Yeah, this, uh, this bike is definitely one to try. So in summary, in summary Nevesy says, think of Ducati's superb new Street Fighter V2 as a modern take on the brilliant old Street Fighter 848. It's cheaper, nimbler and more exciting at normal speeds than its V4 sibling too. Uh, the bike arrives in dealers in the new year. So uh, yeah, Nevesy's a fan. Excellent. Good stuff. All right, one more um, page to go. I see actually the camera is still running with this new fan setup, which is excellent. So maybe the cooling thing's working, but the battery's going to run out soon. So if it suddenly all goes blank, I'll stick a new battery in. I will be back with you. All right, next up, last uh, item then here from the paper. Just wanted to mention this. Guy Martin, big fan of Guy Martin. He's got a new book out. No one's paying me to say anything good about this. I haven't read the book yet, but he tends to bring him out for Christmas. Great idea for a Christmas prezi. It's called Dead Men Don't Tell Tales. All about his um, record-breaking attempts, because at the moment he's trying to go over um, 300 miles an hour on his modified Hayabusa, which is incredible. He says here, I decided I wanted a turbo Hayabusa. I wanted to go fast, and there's nothing better for going fast than a turbo Hayabusa. Then I realised no one had ever gone 300 miles per hour. Uh, on one. You've got to look, he says, anyone who's got close to doing 300 miles an hour uh, in a mile is dead. Uh, it's the most extreme thing I've done in motorbiking. So uh, be careful, Guy. Good luck with that one. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that book of his. I've, written, I've read all these other books. They're very easy to read. Um, great stuff. Uh, I like Guy Martin. Top fella. Looking forward to reading that book. All right, that's it for the um, papers, which means it's time for... <laughs> You got it, parish notices. All right, a few things that I wanted to tell you about uh, in parish notices that I've written down here in my usual very organized way. Hoping I'll get through these before the battery runs out. First off, what I want to say was thank you to everybody that watched the live stream uh, that myself, Lamb Chops, Richie Vida, and Teapot One did uh, last Friday. We had a blast, we went on for over two and a half hours uh, and we actually had over a thousand people watching the whole live stream, which was absolutely brilliant. And uh, I think it's been the most successful live stream in terms of its recorded version to date. Last time I checked, it done well over 20, 22,000 like views, which is amazing for a live stream. So thank you for watching. But I in particular want to thank all those people that uh, uh, um, donated some money during the live stream. And we did, because it's difficult to follow all those comments as they go past, we didn't get a chance to give everyone a shout out. So I want to do that now. So thank you to Adventure Bike Pilot, Niall Matthews, Dave Baxendale, Mark Exley, Ollie Ray, Captain Pugwash Rides, Azric, Cam Craig, and Sylvan Forge 
for your super chat um, donations during the live stream. Very much appreciated. Sorry if we didn't get to mention you and give you a shout out at the time. Hopefully that's gone some way to recompense. So thank you for that. Um, anyway, wanted to do mention, uh, you know, it's coming up the C word, the other C word. Christmas is coming up, of course, and I won't be talking to you again in bike news until after Christmas. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you've got any, um, if you're stuck for present ideas, channel sponsors Speedo Angels don't just make um, um, screen protectors for motorcycles, although they are brilliant, but they make a number of different things in that vein. I just, you may not be aware of these. So I wanted to tell you about them. They do stuff like an anti-fog visor insert. This is a bit like a uh, pin lock. You know, you stick it on your visor, but it's universal, it'll work on any helmet, and they will cost you just, uh, I think, 13.99, so less than 14 quid for one of them. Check out the website. Uh, they also do these. These are wing mirror protectors. These are brilliant. I've got these on my GS, and they also act as an anti-fog as well. Um, if you actually breathe on your mirror with these on, you can't fog your mirror up. They're an excellent addition as well. So I've got these on my GS. If you want the set of those, you can get them bike specific or again generic fit ones. They are, I think, 10.99 if I've written them down correctly. Uh, you can also get a visor cleaner sponge if you've ever seen these V2s. They're excellent just to keep in your pocket, damp to clean your visor if you're a rider all year round and you get that horrible sort of road gunge on your bike, then they're worth considering. And of course, don't forget the uh, the old favorite, the motorcycle dashboard screen protectors that uh, Speedo Angels are renowned for. So do check those out. As ever, on all my videos, there's links below to all my sponsors, but go and check out Speedo Angels, the link below. Uh, if you want uh, something that's top value for money, you know, less than 20 quid, you can get any of those items. So do go and check those out. Uh, next up, coming up in December, I wanted to tell you about a couple of videos coming up. Uh, it's got a packed month actually in December. I've got quite a few videos to get through, more so than uh, usual. Next Saturday, or this Saturday coming up, uh, is a promised video of the Honda Goldwing versus the Goldwing Tour. This is one that's been in the making for a few months. Finished it a couple of weeks ago. That is coming up on Saturday. So if you're interested in the Goldwing, do watch that video. Uh, then I've got a video on the last ride on the Harley Davidson Fat Bob. Again, um, a video that did quite well. The, uh, I did the first ride review. Well, um, I had that bike for a couple of weeks in the summer that video is coming up too then i've got a brand new tour series coming up and this uh, hopefully you're going to enjoy this in these horrible cold dark winter days this one should do you some good because myself and mrs flyer went out to canary motorcycle tours i think it was uh, early november uh, and we've done a tour series for you there's three episodes of these coming up and we're going to run them one after the other in fairly rapid succession so those of you who've asked for more mrs flyer she is coming up and you will be seeing her riding believe it or not in the mountains in grand canary it's absolutely amazing had a great time out there with the guys from Canary Motorcycle Tour. So hello to you guys. Uh, look forward to uh, getting those videos up. I think you're going to enjoy them, so look out for those. Uh, I've got a review of the Street Twin Gold Line coming up. You know who Triumph have brought out the Bonnevilles with the with the Gold Line variants? Well, I've got my hands on the Street Twin, which is their most popular selling uh, retro motorcycle. I haven't ridden one of those for ages, so I've got a review of that coming up. Uh, next bike news is due on the 29th of December, so uh, just before New Year. So put that one in your diary. It'll be something to watch in that sort of dead period between Christmas and the New Year. And I'm hoping if we can get the logistics and weather sorted out, we'll sneak in a little Christmas special biker scram as well before the big, the big day. So that's all coming up. The other thing to mention to you was, of course, this weekend, Motorcycle Live at the NEC is back, kicks off. Uh, hoping that I'm going to see some of you there. I'm there again with Mrs. Flyer uh, on Saturday the 4th. I'm there all day in the morning. Uh, I'm on the Custom Fit Guards stand, and then in the afternoon, I'm on the Image 4 security stand. Those are the guys that make the, the barrier that I've got in my garage. So do, do come and say hello to me and Mrs. Flyer on the stands if you're there on Saturday, uh, because otherwise we'd just be standing there twiddling our thumbs. It would be great to see you. So Custom Fit Guards stand in the morning, uh, uh, image for security in the afternoon. Uh, I don't actually have the locations of where they are, but I'll do some social media stuff probably on Friday, hopefully giving you the details of exactly where they are in the show. So do come and enjoy Motorcycle Live, and do come and say hello if you're coming. Brilliant, all right, that's it then for uh, this bike news. Hope you enjoyed that. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been the Mr. Them Fly. Cheerio. Hey folks, Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. It's that time of the month again when we do a little rip, 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 rip. do it again. Hey folks, it's the Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Well, once again, at the, another month. <laughs> hey folks, Mr. Fly here, hope you're well. Time again for another bike news, this time for the month of November 2021. So if you're interested in what's been going on, one more time. <laughs>